So welcome everybody. Good afternoon. My name, uh, I think I know everybody here, is David Walker. I'm director of the School of Policy Studies and um, would like to welcome you to this event. This is the last of our policy talk series for the academic year. There will be one or two special events yet to come in the academic year, but this is our capstone presentation and we have a very special guest who will be introduced to you in a minute. But I did want to thank all of you for coming from the Speaker of the House at the back, Peter, thank you, uh, our distinguished fellows, adjuncts and our students, and, uh, and thanks again to Celia for organizing this series throughout the year. With that said, I will pass the microphone over to Jennifer Bunning, who's going to introduce our very special guest. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. So, Good afternoon, students, faculty, and community members. My name is Jenny Bunning, and it is my pleasure to host the last policy talk of 2019. We're very fortunate to have Senator Peter Beam here to speak on the topic of global policy channel challenges and the G7. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous territory on which we have the privilege of meeting today. The territory Kingston sits on has been the site of human occupation for thousands of years, and it is the homeland of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. Now, I would like to introduce Senator Peter Beam. A native of Kitchener, Ontario, Peter Beam was appointed to the Senate of Canada in October 2018. A former, career, a former career foreign service officer, he has served as ambassador to Germany, minister at the Embassy of Canada to the United States, as well as ambassador to the Organization of America's, American States, among other foreign postings. He is a former, former deputy minister of international development, senior associate deputy minister of foreign affairs, and assistant deputy minister of the Americas, North America, and consular affairs. He served, as several prime minister, uh, he served several prime ministers as their personal representative, or Sherpa, for the G8 and G7 summits, as well as for the summits of the Americas and Nuclear Security Summit. Most recently, he was the deputy minister and personal representative of the prime minister for the G7 summit held in Quebec in June 2018. Peter Beam holds a PhD in history from the University of Edinburgh, a Master's of Arts in International Affairs from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, and an honor, a Bachelor of Arts from Wilfrid Laurier University. Senator Peter Bean, Beam's talk is sure to get us thinking and asking questions. Please use Slido to ask those questions using the hashtag MPA19. If you don't have a question, you can vote on other questions that are of interest to you. As in the past, we will pose questions with the most votes. We will also take a few questions from the crowd. If you're watching on the live stream, you can also use Slido to ask your questions. Now, please. Join me in welcoming Senator Peter Beam. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. And uh, we are going to have some fun with Slido uh, later. Slido is not a metaphor, by the way, for how questions should be answered. You don't slide away from them. You have to <laughs> answer them directly. Uh, thank you, David Walker, for um, receiving me here uh, as, uh, as well, the School of Policy Studies. I'm delighted to see the Honorable Peter Milliken here, former Speaker of the House of uh, Commons, who, if things get rowdy, can call for order, and, uh, and Bob Wolf, uh, with whom I worked many years ago and, of course, is a professor um, here. And uh, although she isn't here, I want to thank my friend and, uh, and former colleague Margaret Biggs for suggesting this a long time ago, I think it was one week after I was appointed uh, in October, uh, and for generating the invitation uh, to, uh, to come. It's really good to be out of Ottawa, but uh, that's what everyone says these days, if you can uh, get on the road a little bit, and this is a break week for us in the, uh, in the Senate, so it's, uh, it's good to, uh, uh, to get away. And what I want to talk about today is um, some of the current global uh, issues, the challenges they represent to traditional diplomacy, um, and the policies that uh, our government and various Canadian governments, in fact, have taken. Um, and in that context, I'd like to provide you with a bit of a case study of what happened in the past year uh, in, my, uh, in my previous job uh, during our presidency of, uh, of, of the G7. So there are a lot of disruptions uh, to the current rule-based international order, and there are a lot of challenges, and I'm going to uh, 
uh, enumerate them uh, quickly. There's the rise of protectionism. There's the, and related to that, the blunt weaponizing of international trade. And on that, you can think about the steel and aluminum tariffs that have been imposed upon us by uh, the United States. The canola issue currently with, uh, with China, which is connected to something else. There's isolationism, which we see in various parts of, uh, of the world. There are ethno-nationalist policies that governments are, uh, are pushing. And of course, this is connected to, uh, to isolationism. There's a diminished confidence in national and international institutions. And there is unilateralism by some, uh, some of the major powers. With that diminished confidence, there's also a sense of short-termism short on the part of, uh, of governments. Uh, they will take advantage uh, of that diminished confidence. Greater authoritarianism in certain countries, which means trampling on human rights and the, the rule of law and democratic values as we know them. There's a shifting global balance of power uh, and with it, of course, uh, a demographic challenge as well as the world's populations grow in some countries and they shrink in others as the population ages. There are more people underway uh, with their feet displaced uh, internally in the world than there have ever been before. Uh, that said, there are fewer people facing uh, absolute uh, poverty than there have ever been before. But those who are, are moving uh, face challenges that we have really not seen uh, since probably the Second World War. And then it was concentrated basically in, uh, in Europe. There are environmental and climate change uh, issues. We know that uh, all too well with, uh, with global warning, warming. Um, and there appears to be an inability to have a really rational political debate on what climate change means and, uh, and how one has to address the challenge presented. There are health challenges. There's always the danger of pandemics. There's antimicrobial resistance. There's the anti-vaxxer movement, uh, which is, seems to be growing in, uh, in strength. And of course, as a companion, really, to all of these themes, you have the spread of disruptive technologies uh, and, their, and their use. So in that, um, social media is a, is a good example in how social media can sometimes be corrupted. There's uh, cyber security and cyber terrorism. Uh, as, uh, as well, and this in a way acts as a connective tissue to these disruptive things that I have uh, mentioned. So uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the REM song, uh, this may look like the end of the world as we know it, um, but I don't exactly feel fine. And, uh, and why? It's because in many ways we've been at this point before, but never, quite never uh, like this. So in the, the blurb that went out to advertise uh, this, uh, this talk today, there was the question of whether the multilateral institutions uh, that were created following the Second World War, I'm thinking of the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and certainly the United Nations, and then of course there are the regional organizations, whether they can meet the challenge of the 21st century. Well, they didn't meet the challenge of the 20th century. They tried very, very hard, and uh, many countries contributed uh, to them. The, the uh, membership of the United Nations is vast. It includes uh, virtually all countries in the, in the world. And there are a lot of attempts to do things. But at the end of the day, these are the institutions that we have. They're the only institutions uh, that, in fact, that we have. And barring any sort of uh, catalytic event, these are the events, or these are the organizations that we're going to continue to have. And by catalytic event, I mean a, a big world war, a massive pandemic, a huge change in our climate, an asteroid hit, that, that sort of thing that would force us to really examine what we're doing. I don't want to get into dystopian uh, uh, questions. There's a lot of literature out on the market that, uh, that uh, certainly addresses uh, that and you don't have to go too far from The Handmaid's Tale to actually see uh, what it is. The current government of Canada has advanced uh, a number of foreign policy themes. These were articulated by uh, the Foreign Minister, Christia Freeland, in the House of Commons. Uh, the Prime Minister has also touched on these in his various uh, speeches. But part of it is to protect and reform and renew the rules-based international order. Uh, and that is fundamental for 
for Canada. We believe in, uh, in rules. Successive governments have believed in rules, we do, and we believe in multilateral institutions. There's more to this than just Canadian altruism, of which we're justifiably proud, but also our, uh, our support and our involvement in multilateral institutions serves as a very effective policy counterweight to our overwhelming bilateral relationship with our southern neighbor. And, uh, and that for us has provided traditionally in the last century and into the current one, uh, the balance that we have, uh, we have sought. We also really support, and uh, again, different governments have, uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, their universal application, and we need to demonstrate the advantages of being a diverse and being an inclusive society as well through our interventions in international development assistance, uh, for example. Trade diversification is an important uh, aspect as well. We now have a renamed minister uh, and a minister's title of uh, trade diversification. Uh, three quarters of our trade currently is with the United States. It used to be somewhat higher, but 80% of the projected growth globally over the next 20 years is outside of, uh, of the US. So beyond the new Canada-US-Mexico agreement, which we call CUSMA, which the, because Canada has to come first in our treaty law, which the US refers to as USMCA. I'm told that uh, the president uh, liked that because it reminded him of a village people song. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, uh, and Mexico, no doubt, will have another acronym for it. But uh, we, uh, we have to look beyond. And that's why CETA, started by the previous uh, government and concluded by the current one, this is the agreement with, uh, with Europe, uh, is important, as is the CPTPP, as it's called, uh, with the Pacific uh, nations as, uh, as well. So the importance of diversifying our markets will be important for our economy. And certainly if we have all of our, to use the uh, proverbial adage, all of our eggs in one basket, then we can run into problems as we are right now with China with 40% of our canola export, in fact, going to that, uh, that country. So um, with this in mind, I wanted to, uh, to take you uh, uh, back in time, not that far, uh, to our G7 presidency year. Now for Canada, the G7 is really the jewel uh, in, the, in the policy crown. I'm, I'm biased, I've been doing this, uh, had been doing that for a, a long time. Um, in fact, I'd served a number of prime ministers in that respect, as uh, Jen pointed out in her kind introduction. Um, and what we've seen over time is, um, it's not like that, that uh, famous uh, quotation from the Times of London in terms of worlds, uh, most boring headline being another useful Canadian initiative. Uh, it, goes, uh, it goes beyond. For us, we actually think we can make a, a, a difference. So uh, if we look back to 1975 when the G7 was founded, Canada uh, was not uh, there. We uh, showed up in 1976 with Mr. Trudeau Sr. Um, and since then, um, and in 76, we were probably about the seventh largest economic power. We're now arguably at number, number 10, but it's not about uh, economic weight. It's, I think, what you can bring to the table in terms of, uh, in terms of ideas. And it's an organization, and uh, uh, Professor Wolf and I were just speaking at the beginning, that's often misunderstood. And what we tried to do over the past year is um, make it more understandable for Canadians and demystify it somewhat, uh, using social media to, um, to advantage uh, as, uh, as well. Um, for other countries, the G7 is probably not that important. For the US, it's really not that important at all. The US is the G1 uh, after, after all. It's America first, one hears. So, uh, but for us, uh, being engaged and, uh, and taking issues forward is important. It's the G7 that really uh, put together uh, a number of initiatives. Uh, there's the, the Financial Action Task Force, for example, that was created uh, through the G7 to look at flows of funds for corruption and other, uh, and other purposes. The Chernobyl Shelter Fund, to which we still, as Canada, contribute, was brought into play after the Chernobyl uh, nuclear uh, accident uh, many, many years ago. Uh, 
as a way of providing funds and expertise to contain uh, the contamination uh, there. Uh, you might recall the, the Maternal Newborn and Child Health Initiative coming out of Muskoka in 2010 by Prime Minister Harper uh, when, we, uh, when we hosted the last time. Uh, that is still going uh, full, uh, full speed, as is the global fund uh, that addresses uh, AIDS uh, and tuberculosis and, uh, and measles. So there are a number of things that have happened over the years. I don't want to list them, uh, list them all, uh, but they have been rather important. So Canada, we've, we've now hosted uh, the G7 uh, six times, uh, always in different, uh, different places. Um, the last time in 2010, it was a back-to-back -back hosting. There was the, the G8, as it then was, and we can talk about Russia in a moment. Um, in, uh, in Muskoka, and then uh, there was the G20 right afterwards in Toronto. You might remember the, the G20 because there was some action on the streets and police cars were burned and people, demonstrators were, were uh, kettle um, herded and, uh, and arrested. Um, what we learned from that, there were recommendations from the Auditor General to put everything, uh, all responsibility under one person at, uh, at the deputy minister level. So that would mean on engagement, on planning, on budget, on security, and also on the negotiations and, uh, and all the publicity. So that person was yours truly. I had very happily uh, would have continued, or I would have continued happily as deputy minister of international <coughs> development, which is work that I really, uh, really enjoyed. Uh, but uh, I was uh, tapped on the shoulder by our Prime Minister and wa he wanted me to do it. So, in other, in other words, we had it all on, in one big tent. Uh, in terms of approaches, um, many discussions uh, with, with the Prime Minister as we moved into our year on January uh, 1st of 2018. And indeed, we launched our um, themes. Uh, I joined him for Facebook Live uh, uh, before uh, the year actually uh, turned, and I had just come back from all visiting all of the G7 capitals and meeting with my counterparts to have a discussion on the themes to see if we could get uh, support, because you don't want to go off uh, thematically uh, and then find that you don't have support be, uh, behind you. So we did that launch on Facebook uh, Live, uh, and of course we then had to look at what sort of ministerial meetings we wanted to have that would support uh, the agenda that the leaders would eventually discuss in, uh, in Charlevoix. So on the thematic uh, side, what we thought, in past years, uh, this has been something of a cottage industry. There'd be ministerial meetings which seemed to us to be almost having a meeting for the sake of having it. Well, if you're doing something on the taxpayer's dime, you want to make sure that you get, you get results. And so having uh, meetings, um, as was the case in uh, 2017, uh, when we met, when the leaders met in Italy, um, that would come after uh, the, uh, the summit itself didn't really, it seemed counterintuitive to us because you want to have inputs on specific themes that the leaders could then, uh, could then discuss. So we um, uh, played around with that and we decided it would be useful to have uh, ministerial meetings that would align themselves with the themes that were selected. So the, the first one uh, was preparing for jobs of the future, and that was a meeting of ministers of labor and ministers of economic development or innovation. Uh, that took place in Montreal in March uh, of last year. In the past, these meetings have basically been on single tracks, but we thought we would run them in parallel and then have a common session. Why? It's because if you uh, are, look at the trajectory of such meetings, the ministers of labor, they traditionally talk about labor standards, <coughs> social policy, the work that the ILO is doing out of uh, Geneva uh, and the like. And the ministers of innovation are talking about SME, small, medium enterprises, how to stimulate them, how to get innovation going, that sort of thing. But if the topic is the jobs of the future and the impact of artificial intelligence on jobs and on, on retraining and how to be ready, for when your job might disappear because a robot is going to do it, then you have to have at least uh, some sort of cross-pollinization. Uh, and this took place, they had a common session like that. So too, with the meeting of uh, foreign ministers, and there's always a, a theme of peace and, uh, and security, which we, uh, 
which we also put, uh, put forward. The foreign ministers met in Toronto at the same time as the interior or security ministers. So Minister Freeland had her colleagues uh, meet and Minister Goodale had his group meet uh, and they were meeting in parallel but then they had a common session and, and the common session was devoted to counterterrorism, cyber security and how to deal with the issues of foreign interference in our electoral uh, processes. So that one took place as well. There's the traditional finance ministers meeting, which is sort of the raison d'etre of the G7 uh, anyway. Um, but we also wanted to have a meeting of international development ministers because um, if you look at the sustainable development goals or the 2030 agenda, and this is about a $4 trillion uh, expense to achieve this in all countries in the, in the world, it's not gonna happen through official development assistance provided by the taxpayers uh, of the wealthiest countries. It's impossible to sell and impossible to do. You have to look at different and innovative ways of harnessing capital and, uh, and priming the pump for more development. So while the finance ministers were meeting in Whistler, and this was in May, so too the international development ministers were meeting uh, in parallel, and they had a common session to discuss uh, financing international development and innovative uh, new methods. So that was the, uh, the third one. The fourth one we decided to have after the summit, and that was the meeting of environment, energy, and fisheries and oceans ministers for those countries who had them uh, in Halifax uh, in September of last year. The reason for this was to have it, was to have it after the summit uh, so that on the second day of the summit, we, as the chair, the prime minister, could invite uh, leaders of countries who were not in the G7 who might be impacted by climate change developments, particularly oceans, and we wanted to have a focus on plastics uh, in, the, uh, in the oceans as, uh, as well and how to eradicate them. So having leaders of countries from, uh, from the SIDS, the SIDS are, that's the acronym for Small Island Developing States, uh, who have a direct stake in this because their countries could you know, disappear and are on track to disappear, less so in the Caribbean, but more, more so in the South Pacific. Having a few of those, having a few developing countries from Africa who have uh, coastal uh, and uh, other, uh, other questions, uh, that was important. And then, of course, the heads of the four international organizations, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and the OECD. Uh, the OECD for policy reasons, the UN for coordination reasons, and the other two for financial reasons because they could uh, provide uh, some, some support. That was on the second day of the summit. So by the second day of the summit in, uh, in Charlevoix, we in fact had 22 uh, different leaders uh, at, uh, at the table for a good discussion on ocean plastics, uh, and how to, uh, how to move forward, and then eventually this led to a conference that Kenya and Canada co-sponsored that took place uh, in Nairobi that looked at this issue some more and uh, pushed forward on, uh, on, some, uh, on some actions. So um, at the summit itself, so we as, uh, or I as the chair of the uh, Sherpas, advanced the ideas, um, uh, as to what we could have in terms of outcomes. We had a number of, uh, of initiatives or uh, commitments that I'll enumerate in, uh, in a moment. But we had the longest discussion on this tradition of do we have a communique or don't we have a communique? Now the communique is a, is a summary basically that is negotiated as to what the leaders agree on and what they might want to advance and push, whether it's in our own countries or whether it is looking at the broader sense, things that we could take forward to the G20, for example, or that could be deposited uh, in the UN, uh, at the World Bank in terms of policies uh, or what, uh, what have you. The Europeans who uh, meet almost every week in Brussels, I'm being a little sarcastic there, but they, they love their communiques. Um, we are kind of on the fence, and the Americans thought, well, you know, we don't really need a communique if we just have a one-page statement that the president can sign. That's probably good enough. Uh, and that's been their traditional view because uh, they don't attach that much importance to it. For the Japanese, for example, Prime Minister Abe has to take the communique and present it in the diet 
in the Japanese parliament to show that this is what we have done, this is what the Japanese team has negotiated. So there's a, a direct link to the parliamentary democracy in, uh, in Japan. Uh, for us, I'm not sure how many people read it. I'm not sure how many people in this room or, or those who might be watching uh, the webcast uh, read it, but we certainly spend a lot of time on it. And I was uh, of the view that you can negotiate these things, but if you negotiate down to the lowest common denominator, uh, to the last comma and semicolon, and you really debase your currency, then what's the point of having it? So in, in the back pocket, I always had a chair statement that would be shorter and it would be issued by the prime minister that would simply say, we discussed this and this and this and agreed on that and that, rather than seeing ourselves disagree, um, as was the case in Italy and as was the case in Charlevoix as well, because the US had decided to pull out of the Paris Agreement on climate change. So that was reflected, but the rest of us were very committed to it. So we wanted to, uh, to show that. When we uh, finally uh, had the uh, plastics charter, the US chose not to sign on because it did not like quotas. Uh, Japan had not uh, taken enough on enough consultation with its own industry uh, to come up with a, an agreement on plastics that it could agree to. So the US and Japan decided to, uh, to stand apart. Nonetheless, we did have a, we did have a communique um, and I thought it was a very good one. And then we had a number of uh, initiative uh, documents that were set out. But just for a second, on the, on the communique, the communique followed the, the themes, building a more peaceful and secure world, jobs for the future, investing in growth that works for everyone. That's the, uh, that's the economic piece. And there was a separate commitment that we worked on in that uh, in terms of how to invest in, uh, in growth. You see some of that reflected in the federal budget. Uh, that was presented uh, last, uh, last week, a bit overshadowed by other political news in, uh, in Canada, but it is, uh, it is in there as well. Uh, so the jobs of the future, the more peaceful and secure world, uh, different types of financing for uh, development, working together on climate change, oceans, and clean energy. And it's here I should tell you that one of the overarching themes that we, uh, we had uh, all the way through was uh, gender equality. And that permeated everything. Um, the Prime Minister called for the establishment of a Gender Equality Advisory Council. And this was co-chaired by Melinda Gates and by Isabelle Houdon, who's our ambassador in France. Uh, and at every meeting that we had as uh, Sherpas, there were members of the uh, council there who were taking note, who were advising, and we received recommendations as, uh, as well. So the commitments that we came up with at the end, and these are all negotiated documents, were all issued, were the uh, commitment on equality and, uh, and economic growth. And that's also a commitment um, to look at how we measure uh, economic, uh, economic growth and economic uh, change in different ways, not using just the, uh, the GDP argument, but looking at issues like um, child uh, poverty, uh, the gender pay gap, for example, uh, changes in terms of how we would look at issues based on, uh, on minority groups. For us in Canada, Indigenous peoples uh, are a minority group that are challenged. Some of their communities still do not have uh, potable water, uh, and that is being addressed. So there was that, that commitment. There was a commitment on innovative financing for development. I alluded to this earlier and that is how we could work in the context of the OECD and the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD to generate more funds uh, and capital to address the sustainable uh, development goals. There was a common vision for the future of artificial intelligence, and this has led to work within the, uh, in the OECD and among uh, ministers and a conference uh, that uh, took place in, uh, in Montreal as well uh, on, um, on more work and how we could ensure that a transition to an AI-focused economy does not leave uh, people behind, that we are ready for that. Also, a declaration on quality education for girls, adolescent girls, and women in developing countries to ensure that um, girls in particular can, can get, uh, will have the opportunity to have at least 12 years uh, of education uh, before they decide what to do with their lives or whether it's decided uh, for them.
One that I considered pretty important in the context, uh, too, of hashtag Me Too was a commitment, and everyone agreed to this, to end sexual and gender-based violence, abuse, and harassment in the digital context. Um, I can talk more about that later. Uh, we have a commitment on defending democracy from foreign threats, and what that resulted in was to have uh, a rapid uh, reaction uh, group, which is currently chaired by Canada, where we would advise our other G7 partners of something that's going on, whether or not is it, it is during an election campaign. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but if there are other countries, governments, you know who they are, who are trying to, uh, to interfere or distort um, uh, facts or not provide facts, whatever, um, that, uh, that there be a way of letting each other, uh, other know and monitoring uh, that. And then finally, there was the blueprint for healthy oceans, uh, seas, and resilient coastal communities. The resilient coastal communities bit, uh, we uh, wanted to include there because for a, a number of reasons. Um, the intensity of hurricanes and weather type events, it's, it's increasing. Uh, all the science and the evidence points to that being a result of climate change. Not everyone wants to believe that, but that's what the evidence uh, shows. And the impact of major hurricanes, uh, particularly in the southern United States and the Caribbean and Puerto Rico as a protectorate uh, of the U.S., it seemed to us that would be a good way to bring the U.S. into the tent, even though they are saying no to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it was. So there are ways and means, again, to look at how uh, coastal communities can be, uh, can be helped. So that was everything that was released and everyone agreed to it. Uh, we had a last minute discussion with, uh, with President Trump and his team because they weren't necessarily uh, in favor of referring in the preamble of the communique to uh, the value of um, the rules-based multilateral system. Uh, but eventually we got that in as, uh, as well. Uh, and everyone seemed happy until the President got onto uh, Air Force One and sent out a tweet asking for his signature to be removed. There never was a signature uh, by anyone uh, on uh, the communique um, or on any of the documents. What was left behind, and we do this at events in Canada, so for the citizens of La Malbay, which is where the, the summit took place, there was a little scroll, and all the leaders signed that basically to say that they were there and they had, uh, they had a summit. So I think that was the signature that President Trump may be referring to. Um, but and despite all of the attention related to that, um, the work on this very ambitious agenda has, uh, has continued. Um, and I think there are a number of lessons that we've uh, taken from it. And uh, before I became a parliamentarian and before I retired, which was three days of retirement, uh, I went to, uh, to Paris to meet with my counterpart at the Elysee uh, to talk about their summit because we have passed the torch on to the French. They are hosting in August the uh, G7 summit in Biarritz uh, in France, um, just in terms of how to, uh, how to do things. And I think the French are also pondering uh, how much they want to press on a communique on initiatives. Their overarching theme is inequality, which of course is very, uh, very, much of the, of the moment, and of, we're seeing some of that, those protests uh, on the streets of France as well, and indeed there are concerns in all of our countries about people being left behind economically uh, speaking. But uh, there is an importance, I think, and I want to underscore this, of having coherent strategies as you, uh, as you move forward. There is a lot more to these international uh, events than you, uh, than you see through the media. In fact, it seemed that there was some disappointment that we didn't have a riot in Quebec City or anything, uh, anything like that. We did, uh, we did not. We planned well. We had uh, worked closely with the RCMP and with the security forces. I met with the Premier of, uh, of Quebec. Uh, we did everything uh, we felt we needed to do uh, domestically, and we put Canada's uh, best face forward uh, globally. But you've got to be ready for the unexpected. Um, and you have to be agile in terms of having an ability to, uh, to adjust uh, 
Um, and you have to also look at non-traditional diplomacy. We went really heavy on social media, on Twitter, on be behind the scenes uh, activities, trying to explain to Canadians what was going on, uh, that this was not just a multi-million dollar uh, big event uh, or series of events if you include the ministerial meetings, but it, it actually mattered. And we had to um, kind of thread the, uh, or find the, the, the golden path between uh, non-traditional diplomacy or traditional diplomacy, which is really, the definition of that is letting someone else have your way and my way or no way, which is what we were hearing from at least one delegation. So that meant uh, some rather uh, deft, uh, deft work and uh, uh, and that's basically how we ended it. So I just wanted to give you that uh, bit of a look behind, uh, behind the scenes. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. And indeed, I'm, I'm happy to try to respond to any questions on anything, quite frankly. Thank you. All right, so let's start with our Slido question. The first one is, should China be invited to join the G7? Absolutely not. You want more? Okay. So um, China is already in the G20. Uh, China, I don't think, belongs in the G7 because China does not have the same values uh, that the G7 members have, and that is uh, support for uh, rules for democracy, uh, the rule of law, we're seeing that right now in terms of uh, our own interactions with, uh, with China. I think it's really uh, sad that uh, we have two Canadian citizens who were arrested uh, without charges who've now been held for almost three months, or more than three months actually, um, and uh, can still not receive legal counsel. Uh, and the like. Uh, then there are the other pressure tactics that are, that are being exerted. That's uh, not the way we would like to deal and it's not the way that uh, the other countries around the table uh, do deal. Maybe we'll take a question from the audience. Yes. Sure. Yes, sir. Should Russia be reinvited to the G7? Donald Trump thinks so. Um, and he said, uh, uh, no, I, uh, I don't. <laughs> Surprise, huh? Um, I, I was, uh, uh, my first summit as Sherpa was with Mr. Harper in Northern Ireland at, uh, at Loch Hearn, uh, and it was the last G8 summit. And the next summit was going to take place in Sochi. And I, in fact, went to the, uh, the first uh, Sherpa meeting in Moscow. It was a great meeting. Everybody was happy. It looked like we were going to have a good agenda. And then right after the Olympics uh, took place, the Russians took Crimea. So they bucked the trend and violated the international rules-based order, as we understand it, and uh, did not back down. But I think we saw the scenes of that uh, even at the last G8 summit where the dinner conversation, only the leaders, but we Sherpas were, uh, were plugged in, uh, was all about Syria. And uh, Mr. Putin was going on about how everyone re should really support Bashar al-Assad. Um, no one agreed with him. So it was clear that, you know, there was that. Uh, I sense you have a follow-up. I think you mentioned uh, President Trump. Do you think he's possibly on division from G7? As, as the members, is he instigating division? No, not just the G7, I should <laughs> modestly add. Um, We're talking about G7. Yes, we are. Uh, he, just in, I'll give you a personal observation, uh, since I was in uh, Sicily um, at the one uh, the year before, uh, that was his first, he was relatively new, so there, there was a lot of listening, and he said he wanted to keep an open mind on climate change, and the other leaders were speaking about how uh, climate change and the Paris Agreement was, uh, was important. Uh, it was a bit like watching an episode of The Apprentice, in a way. Um, but by the next year, so our year, he uh, was pretty clear on, uh, on views. And I find it very ironic, um, and I was uh, mentioning this, this earlier to Professor Wolf, that uh, 
we were having a, a big discussion at every Sherpa meeting on how to deal with over, global overcapacity in steel. And we were looking at how we could work together to really approach China, work together as, uh, as the G7. And the Americans listened and everything, and then they took a unilateral decision to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum, not just on China, but on all of us uh, as well. And this remains the sticking point in the new, the new NAFTA. So to get to the, the root of your question, he's, uh, he's found his, uh, his authority, and his authority is unilateral. It's not cooperative. This might lead nicely into the next question on Slido, which is the G7 sustainable if the U.S. continues to be less committed? Well, I think that's a very good question, and, uh, and I think we're going to see this in, uh, in August in, uh, in France. And if we don't see it in August in France, then we'll see it in 2020, because guess who's hosting the G7 in 2020? It's the United States. So I don't know where it's going to be. Mar-a-Lago, pay as you go. I have, I have no idea. Uh, but. Uh, that's uh, it's a that's a very good question, and I frankly don't know. All right, let's uh, move to the next. What what will Brexit mean for the CETA? Well, for CETA, so whichever way Brexit goes, and uh, it's you know it's a it's a bit like well, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's uh, you just don't know. It's very difficult to predict whether we're going to see uh, the so-called hard Brexit or the the plan that Theresa May. Uh, negotiated uh, going forward. Our CETA will continue. It's, uh, it's there. It, in fact, is being implemented. It not, has not been ratified by all of the countries. But we have been in discussions with the, uh, with the UK. So uh, I suspect that there will be, uh, we, will be something uh, bilateral, Canada, UK, at, uh, at some point, assuming that a Brexit goes the way it looks like it might. Or if uh, the UK wants to get into uh, to EFTA, which is the uh, agreement that, uh, that Norway and Switzerland, uh, for example, have with, uh, with Europe, that might be another, another thing to, uh, to look at. Um, uh, I don't know, but at the moment, that's about all I can say. All right, maybe a question from the floor? No? Okay, moving back to Slido. Um, will the Biarritz Summit review progress on the Char Charlevoix commitment? I might have... Yeah, it. well, it, uh, it will, and there's always, um, there's, um, in fact, it was uh, Mr. Harper who, uh, who, who started this. There is uh, an, an accounting that play, takes place. There's an accountability report uh, under the Italians. It was on education. Uh, for us, it was on women's economic um, empowerment. And there's a report that's written, and it is a bit of a report card uh, of everyone. Um, it takes a while to get these things through, mainly to get them through uh, governments who are not crazy about being uh, assessed. And the, the chief government who doesn't want to be assessed in that way is the U.S., because the U.S. argument was, well, why should we be responsible for anything that happened under the Obama administration. So those accountability reports uh, are, uh, are released, uh, they're looked at. If you're really interested in accountability, go to the U of T Monk School uh, website. There's a, a G7 research unit uh, that uh, Professor John Curtin has been running for many, many decades out of U of T, and they've got all of these statistics there in, in terms of compliance and, and accountability. So you'd mentioned cybersecurity. How do nations share information on cyber attacks while still protecting citizens' privacy? Well, that's a good question because the privacy laws are different in every country. And we had a, a, a long discussion on this. I think it was the all-nighter Sherpa meeting we had in Bay St. Paul uh, on just how to reflect that. And you'll see that uh, the way we've done it is in, in keeping the reference is in keeping with the privacy laws of uh, the individual countries. There's no global governance for this yet. There might be uh, at, uh, at some point. Uh, how did the term Sherpa come to be affiliated with your position? I love that question because um, <laughs> I've been trolled on this uh, on, uh, on Twitter and, uh, and not in a malicious, uh, a malicious way. Um, 
the, uh, the term is actually personal representative of the president or personal representative of the prime minister, whatever the, the case might be. But uh, the whole thing is it's the summit analogy. And if you think of the Himalayas and Everest, it's the Sherpas. And the Sherpas, that's actually an ethnic group uh, in Nepal who had helped the, uh, the leader of the expedition, think of Sir Edmund Hillary going to, to uh, Everest the first time and Tensing Norgay, his Sherpa, by basically carrying their stuff and guiding them towards the pinnacle. So it came into the parlance that way, but I was asked whether this was not cultural appropriation, and that might be, I know it's an anonymous question, but that might be the, uh, the purpose of the, the question. And in fact, I was uh, repeatedly advised by a gentleman in Winnipeg who, uh, who said, you know, you should be getting permission from the Sherpas in uh, Nepal to, uh, to use this term. It's been around, it's been used in, in this particular industry for, for, uh, for some time. The great irony is I have real Sherpas who follow me on Twitter. And they're, they're not old guys like me. They're, uh, you know, buff young guys with sunglasses and uh, with K2 or Everest uh, behind them. So that's my... Uh, non-answer to what is a, a good question. All right, so uh, how do we improve the public's perception of these summits? So I know you mentioned social media and non-traditional diplomacy, are there other techniques? Yeah, so we, we tried our best. We had uh, several million impressions on our various uh, websites. We had a behind the scenes a series uh, also on our websites, we used Instagram, we, we used Slido at events like this where I would be uh, uh, talking about our themes and trying to get inputs uh, from people. Did that across the country. Didn't come to Kingston, but did that across the country. Um, and, uh, and the Prime Minister was also quite, uh, quite active on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, because it was in Quebec, uh, there was a, a more interest, I think, proportionately uh, by the uh, francophone media. So uh, Radio Canada did a, a bit of a behind the scenes uh, documentary uh, starring uh, an uncomfortable yours truly uh, okay. in terms of uh, how we actually uh, did the work. They came to the Sherpa meetings uh, and, uh, and the summit itself. So we like to think that uh, we made a bit more of an impact in terms of demystifying what all of this is to, uh, to Canadians. Uh, whether we succeeded or not, um, uh, I don't know. The newsworthiness always tends to be if there is a massive disagreement uh, or if there is, uh, is violence. We had, under the Charter, of course, we're responsible to have a designated protest area. Uh, there was one in, uh, in La Malbe, uh, close to the summit site, uh, and there were only about two protesters there. and. We had screens where we could see the protest site, the leaders could see the protest site, but there were just two protesters protesting against one particular leader. And at one point we noticed, I think it was President Macron, that a fox was running across the, uh, uh, the field. So that was it in terms of the protest element. But we think we made a bit of an impact. All right. I should just do a quick survey. Yes. Uh, the Prime Minister has often said uh, Canada's back and you've been involved in our international work for a long time. So I'm wondering if you could kind of rank uh, what is our international status at this time, not so much in the short term, but over the long term, the last 20 years. Are we more engaged or less engaged, or how would you see us now? Well, now that I'm a parliamentarian, I can say what I really think, right? <laughs> uh, the others do, so I might as well. I think we're, we're kind of on a steady, uh, on a steady level. Um, uh, I, I know that uh, during, uh, well, we're a steady level for a number of reasons. Uh, we have uh, very well-trained diplomats, and I don't say that out of a sense of bias, but we've got people who are really, really good. And they are the, you know, they are the negotiators. So for negotiating NAFTA a second time, uh, were it a, a Shear government or a Harper government or a Singh government, they'd have the same negotiating team the pros, and we do, uh, we do very well. And the people we send to our multilateral missions are, uh, are well informed. We train people in the languages, so we're out there. In terms of the policies that are uh, set, you will have seen some differences between the Harper and the, and the Trudeau period in terms of, uh, of emphasis. Um, 
but I think it, it kind of comes out as, uh, as a baseline in a, in, in a way. So if uh, Mr. Trudeau and his government are pushing gender equality a little bit more, uh, maybe Mr. Harper was pushing another, uh, another issue uh, as well, and it, it, it kind of comes out. There's a respect that Canada has internationally because of our commitment over the years, whether it is fighting for good causes in world wars, in peacekeeping, in terms of our international development assistance, people will say it's never enough. That's probably true, uh, but we're wise, I think, in ter terms generally, in terms of how we uh, how we allocate that. Where we've taken, I think, um, uh, again, this is uh, my very much my view, an unfair beating uh, recently has been on the the China issue in all of its complications, and also the overreaction by Saudi Arabia for what I, I think is, was uh, a legitimate um, uh, complaint or concern that was, uh, that was expressed in terms of how women activists were being uh, dealt with in, uh, in, that, uh, in that country. So that can have repercussions uh, with others. It might have repercussions for us in our United Nations Security Council campaign where the vote is, uh, is secret uh, and countries have, uh, have allies. And, and as I mentioned in my, in my remarks, um, uh, social media and, uh, and the world out there, there's a, there's a fair amount of viciousness and distortion uh, as well. Those are the challenges we face. Yes, sir. Just to follow up that question, yeah. uh, with your experience with the G7, uh, what advice would you give the G7 leaders to make this progress? Well, uh, my advice, and I think this is also why the G7 has, uh, has lasted uh, so long, because, uh, uh, you know, why would you uh, budget, you know, $500 million or so for a year of, uh, of activity? A lot of that is security, of course, if there was no reason to do it. They like to get together. They like to get together. It's different also from the G20 because it is a small circle. It is just, it's just like this. It's the seven leaders plus two from the EU and behind them is, is the Sherpa, and that's it. So they can have an unscripted discussion on the things that matter to them. So if President Macron this year wants to have a real discussion on inequality, I've got the Gilets Jaunes, they're, they're rioting every, uh, every Saturday. You know, uh, we've all got these problems, how do, we, how do we deal with it? So fundamentally, um, the discussions that I have witnessed um, in the past, including at the last four summits on the subject of China has been fascinating. And as a Canadian, I felt proud that we were at that table with my leader, whether it was Harper or, uh, uh, or Trudeau. So too on, on some other, uh, other issues. So I think that's, that's the way to sort of present it and to say to leaders, every leader who comes in is very skeptical. I remember having a, uh, I'm gonna drop names, but a, a conversation some time ago when I was in, in Washington with, uh, with George W. Bush when he was president. He's very skeptical about these things. Why are we doing this? You know, it costs a lot of money. What's the interest? What's the political interest? And then he got hooked. They all, they all do, and they find that these discussions are useful. Um, and I think that's uh, in a world that has a lot of challenges, the ones I, uh, I mentioned, having some like-minded countries around the table making suggestions. It's not a World Governance Council as some of the uh, uh, interest groups and advocates would uh, would say, but it's one that can nudge, uh, can nudge our multilateral institutions, can nudge other countries, and and uh, these countries can serve as examples uh, for others as well. This might lead well. I'm going to skip the order because they all have one vote. Um, but can you describe the interpersonal dynamics of G7 leaders at those private discussions? <laughs> yeah, I got to write about that somewhere. <laughs> um, I think. You know, they're, at least in the, in the G7, they're all on a first name basis. It is pretty relaxed, uh, despite what you read. Uh, there's often uh, humor there because um, they're elected politicians. You know, they, they have the same concerns. Am I gonna get reelected? Um, I have a policy concern on the finance side. I have high unemployment. Uh, I have some concerns on exports. We have a a disagreement with country X, how have you handled country X? Um, do you have concerns uh, with organized labor the way I do on, on certain things? So 
They have, uh, they have all of that. So it's, it's actually uh, quite, uh, quite collegial. It can get a bit intense on, uh, on certain issues. The, the trade and tariff discussion at Charlevoix was, in fact, pretty intense. The, uh, the leaders of the countries, the other countries, other than the US, came in very, very prepared. Um, uh, our prime minister did a very good job of chairing the, uh, the meeting uh, and keeping the discussion uh, flowing. So there's, uh, I think there's that element and the leaders like that. And that's another reason, getting back to the last question uh, on, uh, on symmetry, um, when they can get together like that and basically uh, let their hair down, at least a little bit. All right, let's uh, switch directions a little bit. Well, there's some students in the room. What yeah. kind of advice do you have for students who'd like a career in global affairs? Well, I think it's a great career. I mean, I'm biased, I, I did it. Um, but uh, it, uh, for me, coming out of, uh, out of graduate school uh, and writing applications to try to teach at universities and having everyone rejected, um, I had written the foreign service exam, never got a call back, uh, wrote it a second time, then I was asked to come for an interview. Uh, and I was, uh, I was fortunate. I didn't have any, uh, any prospects uh, there. Now, it's different now because that exam is not there, but I think applying, circulating your CV, indicating your interest is, uh, is important. The, the beauty of a career like this, or like the one I used to have before I became a parliamentarian, um, is that you change your job every three or four years. So I was, uh, I was in Varadero, I was in Cuba with my, uh, with my family uh, last week, that's why I'm a little darker than normal. Um, that was my first posting, was, uh, was Havana. Uh, and that, I was there, sir, I'm gonna show you my age, but before the Berlin Wall came down. So there still was the Soviet Union. I was at the bottom of the heap in the embassy, but we had a great time, sit around having discussions with Fidel Castro. I mean, you know, you, you can't, this is the stuff you sort of dream about. Um, and so every three or four years, or maybe even less than that, you're changing jobs. So it keeps the mind uh, fresh, um, and there's no better perspective. And I say this without wanting to sound maudlin at all. There's no better way to get an appreciation of your own country and what you have than sitting for a few years in another place. Whether it's, I spent seven years in Washington, D.C. Uh, four at the OAS as ambassador, three at the, uh, at the embassy. I was there when 9-11 took place. Uh, and I developed a much better appreciation of Canada, our response, our values, our friendship with the U.S. through that, through that experience, as an example. So uh, I highly recommend it, and uh, if you have an interest in, uh, in foreign lands, if you speak and want to learn uh, other languages, it's for you. Write to me if you're, if you're interested. Uh, uh, the Senate website has my email account. All right, so speaking of values, um, gender equality commitments are mentioned a lot lately, perhaps to as tokenism. But how do you think discourse slash practice has fundamentally changed in our approach? Um, I think it's, um, it's a gradual process. It has been uh, accelerated. There's a lot that's going on uh, domestically. Uh, you will see that there is a, there is a, a new department. Uh, so the status of Women Canada is now um, the wage department, so Women's Affairs and Gender Equality, uh, wage for, uh, for short. Uh, there's more work uh, going on there. In fact, I just uh, spoke on the weekend with um, Maria Monsef, who is the minister of wage, but is also now the Minister of International Development, and that's really where a lot of this comes together. One of the things I was involved in was the, the uh, uh, development policy, international development policy review, uh, and that resulted in the feminist international assistance policy, which has a greater focus to helping women and girls at the grassroots level in, uh, in developing countries and providing them with, uh, with opportunities. So what we are doing, trying to do abroad, I think we are practicing at home. I think there's a greater uh, interaction too between the federal and provincial governments and even municipalities. Um, there is more education that is coming along. There's also a commitment to, in, to educate 
newcomers to Canada where the cultural differences, particularly on gender, might be, uh, might be greater. Uh, so I, I see this as all as, uh, as incremental, uh, and the incrementalism is increasing in its, in its velocity. It could, could go a lot faster, but uh, we, we, shall, uh, we shall see. But I think the fact that we managed to uh, bring it back to the G7, uh, have a gender equality advisory council, and having President Macron continue this, and, uh, and he added a few more uh, people uh, to it, um, is, uh, I think, a good sign. Uh, the, the key, though, will be what happens in, in the G7 context in 2020, and that goes back to an earlier point. All right, we have time for one more question, and I know you were trying to avoid current events in Ottawa, but they followed you here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> does political instability surrounding the PMO influence our global policy strategy development? Well, um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, our, our foreign policy, it's more or less on a, on a steady keel, I would, I would say. There are big, big challenges now. Uh, I think in getting out of our, uh, the difficult spot we're in with China is going to take some time. And I, I don't think there's an easy solution for that one, except some solid behind the scenes <laughs> diplomacy, which of course we don't, uh, don't hear about. Um, I, uh, in my time, worked very closely with the senior people in, in the Prime Minister's office. I never had a problem. Uh, if I wanted access to him, I had it. Uh, some decisions I had to take, others I was uncomfortable making. I needed uh, guidance, I needed his, uh, his guidance, so I, uh, I, I did not personally have any, uh, uh, any difficulties. But uh, I think uh, policy, we are moving into an electoral period. Uh, the budget that was presented is an election type budget, but it's also, if you look consistent with previous budgets that this government has, uh, uh, has presented. So I think policy development uh, continues, and then we will see again in, in Canada after the election, there will be a speech from the throne, whether which, from whichever party forms, uh, forms the government, and we'll see more policy initiatives set out at that time. Thank you so much. On behalf of the MPA class of 2019, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Joining a round of applause. Thank you.